Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases and today we are covering another solved case. And in fact, this week we are covering a non-Australian case. Now, personally, I have not seen anyone here on YouTube discussing this case. So you guys will have to let me know down below if you have heard of it. And I rarely do do international cases here on the channel, but I saw it on an episode of Forensic Files quite a few years back. And the case has always just stuck in my mind. Then recently, I was reading this book here, highly recommend by the way, and there was a whole chapter on this particular case, and it reminded me of why it never left my mind. So without further ado, let's get into it. So we're heading back to the year of 1985 in Lexington County, South Carolina, USA. There lived 17-year-old high school senior Sharon Faye Smith, but her friends and family called her Sherry. Sherry was born on June 25, 1967 in South Carolina to parents Robert and Hilda Smith. She also had two siblings, an older sister, 21-year-old Dawn, and a younger brother, Robert Jr., Sherry was described as outgoing, witty, bubbly, beautiful, both inside and out, and someone that just had a zest for life. She was also incredibly mentally strong, which will become apparent as we go on. The sisters, Shari and Dawn, were also very close. Just a few years apart in age, they looked more like twins, with their blonde hair, blue eyes, and similar features. Together, they both enjoyed singing, horse riding, and swimming. The Smith sisters, as they were commonly known as, frequently sung at church, local nursing homes, and in fact, Shari was due to sing at her upcoming graduation ceremony at Lexington High School, the school she attended, which was just days away when the following events occurred. Shari and Dawn actually remind me of this book I read or this book series I read growing up called Sweet Valley. It featured two beautiful beautiful, blonde, identical American twin girls named Jessica and Elizabeth, and they both even had a brother like Shari and Dawn. And the series kind of just revolves around their near-perfect lives. I always kind of envied them when I was growing up. Anyway, let me know if anyone that is watching Red Sweet Valley tell me I'm not the only one. Mind you, it never really was popular here in Australia. But anyway, I guess you could say that the Smith family were really your all-American type of family. They attended church, were very close-knit, and were well-known and respected within their community. And speaking of, Shari's faith and her belief in Jesus and God was a massive part of her life and something she held very close to her heart. I mentioned a moment ago, Shari was just about to graduate and I suppose start summer holidays, given the following events occurred in late May and I believe June to August is summer in the US. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. I think so. Anyway, she had a post-graduation cruise planned for herself and some school friends, which she was incredibly excited about. And something else I'm sure she was no doubt excited for was spending some more quality time with her steady boyfriend, Richard. So this brings us to May 31, which was a warm and sunny Friday in South Carolina and the perfect day for a graduation pool party, which was exactly what Shari had planned for that day. She wore white shorts, a yellow shirt and a yellow and black bathing suit underneath. By mid-afternoon, Shari was on her way home. By the way, I'm not 100% sure if it's Shari or Shari, but I'm just going to go with what I've been saying, which is Shari. Or have I been saying Shari? Hopefully I've been saying it correctly, but it is short for Sharon nonetheless. As she began to pull into her family's long driveway, she decided to stop and check the mail. The mailbox, by the way, was roughly 700 feet or 213 odd metres from the house. So it made sense for family members to stop their car and check the mail when coming and going. So 
Shari stops her car, leaving the motor running, and hopped out to see if there was any mail. Her father, Robert, who was in the house, also happened to see Shari pull up to check if they had any letters. It was 3.38pm and Shari Smith would never be seen alive again. About 10 minutes later, Robert realises that Shari has still not entered the home. He looks outside to see what's going on, but all he could see was Shari's parked car by the letterbox and no Shari. So Robert gets in his own car to go and investigate. He drives a short distance down to the letterbox where he finds Shari's car with the motor still running, door open and her purse lying on the front seat. But Shari is nowhere to be seen. The mail she had collected was lying scattered on the ground. And as you can imagine, alarm bells begin to ring loudly in his head. It's highly unlikely that his happy, fun-loving daughter just decided to run off. And because Shari was actually diabetic, she rarely went anywhere without her medication, let alone just wandering off on foot with none of her possessions. Robert promptly drives back to the house, informs his wife of the situation and phones the Lexington County Sheriff's Department. What followed would be the biggest manhunt in the history of South Carolina. Up until that point, and I actually believe this case remains South Carolina's biggest manhunt, from what I could tell. It's also worth noting that where Shari lived in Lexington County, it was, from what I can gather from my research, a really safe area, back in the mid-1980s at least. So an abduction like this was incredibly shocking to both law enforcement and to the locals. Very early on in this investigation, those close to Shari were ruled out as suspects, particularly her father and her boyfriend. So if it wasn't someone that was close to Shari or somebody with a personal vendetta against her or her family? Who did this and would they strike again? If you're an avid true crime watcher, you're going to be aware that the hardest cases to solve are the ones that are completely random and this fell into that category. And to make matters even more difficult for the investigation, there was no witnesses, there was not a vehicle that was seen speeding away, no evidence left behind at the crime scene, no, no sign of a struggle, and not even so much as a scream was heard at the time of the abduction. And due to the fact that the Smith family were a well-known family in the Lexington County, investigators were actually expecting some sort of ransom call because after all, what other reason was there for someone to randomly abduct a young girl in a safe town? And it wasn't long before this predicted phone call came. Shari's mum, Hilda, picked up the phone and heard a distorted male voice at the other end saying, So you know this is not a hoax. Shari had on a black and yellow bathing suit beneath her shirt and shorts. Hilda let the caller know that her daughter was diabetic and needed frequent food and water, and the caller implied that Shari was safe and well. However, at no point during this call did Shari's abductor mention any kind of ransom. The call simply ended with, you'll get a letter today. I'll try to put recordings of the phone calls throughout this video where I can, by the way. I just don't know how much I'll be able to put in without being copyrighted. So with the mention of a letter, investigators headed straight to the post office to search through piles and piles of mail, hoping to find the one that was addressed to the Smith family. And soon they found it. Up until this point, the Smith family had held out at least some level of hope that Shari would be returned home safely. But the title of the letter sent chills through everyone. The letter from Shari was titled, Last Will and Testament. 
So I'm going to have the letter on the screen for you, but I'll be reading it in full for two reasons, even though it is relatively long. One, the writing is a little hard to read, especially on the screen, and two, I simply believe this letter is worthy of being read in full. I think to really understand the impact of the letter and get a glimpse as to who Shari was as a person, it's worth hearing this entire thing. So the letter was dated on June 1, 1985 at 3.10am. So roughly 12 hours after her abduction. Down the left hand side of the letter, you'll see that Shari has written God is love in capital letters. And in the top right hand corner, she has written I love y'all. And by the way, you're about to hear my Aussie accent completely butcher the word y'all about 100 times. So let's just ignore that. I, I can't say it. I can't say it with conviction at least. As I said, the letter was titled Last Will and Testament and it reads as follows. I love you, mummy, daddy, Robert, Dawn and Richard and everyone else and all the other friends and relatives. I'll be with my father now, so please, please don't worry. Just remember my witty personality and great special times we shared together. Please don't ever let this ruin your lives. Just keep living one day at a time for Jesus. Some good will come out of this. My thoughts will always be with and in you. In brackets, casket closed. I love you all so damn much. Sorry, Dad, I had to cuss for once. Jesus, forgive me. Richard, sweetie, I really did and always will love you and treasure our special moments. I ask one thing though, accept Jesus as your personal saviour. My family has been the greatest influence of my life. Sorry about the cruise money. Someday please go in my place. I'm sorry if I ever disappointed you in any way. I only wanted to make you proud of me because I have always been proud of my family. Mum, Dad, Robert and Dawn, there's so much I want to say that I should have said before now. I love you. I know y'all love me and will miss me very much. But if y'all can stick together like we always did, y'all can do it. Please do not become hard or upset. Everything works out for the good of those that love the Lord. All my love always... Sharon Shari Smith. I love y'all with all my heart. P.S. Nana, I love you so much. I kind of always felt like your favorite. You were mine. I love you all a lot. I'm sure we all need maybe a minute to process Shari's letter and let it sink in. And I think now you can understand why I described her as incredibly strong at the beginning. When you truly take in what she must have gone through, what must have been running through her head at the time of writing it, knowing she was probably going to die. Yet you can tell this letter was written with love, with faith and with positivity, which I think is truly incredible and admirable, especially at just 17 years old. But I think that the thing that got to me the most were the two words, casket closed. All I can think was that Shari knew what was going to happen to her and to her body. And it's a chilling thought. And you can probably see why this case has stuck with me for so long. It's pretty hard to forget a person like Shari and a story like hers. Once you hear it, I don't think you can forget it. So of course, the letter was sent off for testing and it was confirmed to be Shari's handwriting, but it was also tested for fingerprints, hairs, fibres, etc. Unfortunately, nothing was found, but the letter did hold the key to solving this case. They just didn't know it yet. You see, the letter contained somewhat of a secret message that not even Shari or her abductor were aware of. But we'll get back to that in just a little bit. On Monday, June 3, the Smith family received a second phone call. Have you received the mail today? Uh, yes, I have. Do you believe me now? Well, I don't really sure I believe you. Because I haven't had any word from Sherry. 
and I need to know that Sherry is well. You don't know in two or three days. Why two or three days? Call the search off. Later that night, however, he called back again, once again speaking with Hilda, telling her... I want to tell you one other thing. Sherry is now part of me, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I'm so one now. So this last call in particular, besides being incredibly creepy, was somewhat confusing. He said Shari was protected, but on the other hand, and in my opinion, the rest of what he said implied she was deceased, and that is also what the investigation believed. He was just saying it in his own roundabout, disturbing, going in circles type way. He was basically playing mind games. And of course, the investigation was recording, analysing and tracing all of these phone calls. But because it was 1985, the trap and trace technology wasn't quite good enough to get an instant location. So by the time they were able to trace the location, which were coming from phone boxes in the area, the perpetrator was long gone. The next day, which was Tuesday, June 4th, the caller rang again. This time, he had a new request. He wanted to speak with Shari's 21-year-old sister, Dawn. During the phone call, he told Dawn all about the abduction, how he thought Shari had looked friendly, how he took photos of her, and then he told Dawn how he forced Shari into his vehicle at gunpoint. And I just want to make a quick video interruption here to say this really quickly because there was actually an incident in Australia several days ago where a girl was stabbed and put in a car boot. In an effort to escape, she actually kicked out the tail light from the inside of the boot and stuck her hand out to signal to passing vehicles for help. Anyway, people noticed and she was rescued and survived. But it's one of those unusual pieces of advice that I've only really heard on a true crime podcast, but never in real life. So let me say this. And never allow them to take you to the second location. Repeat that to yourself. I actually heard it on Oprah years ago and I never forgot it. I'll leave the video from Oprah down below. It's like two minutes, but it could save your life one day. But in summary, no matter how they threaten you, no matter what happens, don't allow them to take you to the second location. Because once you're there, you're alone, you're isolated, and honestly, you're in trouble. If they want to kill you, let them kill you at that first location. I'm pretty sure I have mentioned this advice in a much older video, but anyway. Back to the phone call with Dawn and the perpetrator. He said to Dawn, Okay, 4.58 a.m. No, I'm sorry, hold on. 3.10 a.m. Saturday. The first of June, she hand wrote what you received. 4.58 a.m. Saturday, the first of June. Okay, Saturday, the first of June, 4.58 a.m. Became one soul. Became one soul. What does that mean? No questions now. Please, to assure myths, search no more. Blessings are near. Do not kill my daughter, please. I mean, please. We love and miss y'all. The phone call ends with him telling Dawn that Shari would be returned the following evening as he would be providing instructions on where to find them, but they should have an ambulance on standby. So there is two things worth noting about this particular call. One, the investigators realized that the perpetrator was reading off of a script. He was making mistakes he seemed to lose his place, and then he would carry on. And two, investigators were now more certain than ever that Shari Smith was deceased, with her time of death being Saturday, June 1, at 4.58am, just after she wrote her last will and testament. 
The next day, as promised, the caller phoned and provided Hilda with a series of instructions, or actually, directions. Hello? This is Jeffrey. Take Highway 378 West. Get traffic circle. Take Prosperity Exit. Go one and a half miles. Turn right at sign. Moose Lodge number 103. Go one quarter mile. Turn left at right frame building. Go to backyard. Hilda, who was frantic to find her daughter, told investigators that she was coming with them, but they of course insisted that she didn't. And in the end, she didn't, and this would turn out to be a very wise decision. The call's instructions led investigators 18 miles or 28 kilometres out to Saluda County. There, they located the white-framed building, and this is where they found the body of Shari Faye Smith, still dressed in her white shorts, a yellow shirt, and black and yellow swimsuit. Investigators didn't believe that Shari had been killed there, and also found no additional clues at the scene. And unfortunately, even Shari herself was unable to provide the investigation with any real clues regarding her final hours. Due to the condition of her body, they were unable to determine her cause of death or if she had been sexually assaulted. The only thing they could tell was that Shari had been killed within hours of her abduction. And to this day, it's still thought that her time of death was 4.58 on June 1. And they also believed that she was potentially suffocated because duct tape residue was found around her face. And something that the caller would say later would kind of verify this theory. Investigators also believed that the killer was likely local given the location of the body and the directions that he provided. So the investigation was now officially a homicide investigation and they needed to work pretty fast to solve it before this person, who seemed to have struck at random just for the fun of it, killed again. Now you'd think that because the last call was directions to find Shari, that this would have been the last call he made to the Smith family. But no, unfortunately it was not. He continued to torment Shari's family as they prepared for her funeral, again insisting on speaking to Dawn. And the terrible thing was that they had to continue to take these awful phone calls and try to keep this monster on the line in an effort to have any chance of solving this case. So during a phone call that was just before Shari's funeral, the caller rattled on to Dawn all about how sorry he was and asked her family for their prayers and their forgiveness. He also told Dawn he was either going to hand himself in to the police the next day or kill himself. He said, quote, things just got out of hand and all I wanted to do was make love to Dawn. I've been watching her for a couple of... And this is where Dawn suddenly cuts him off. To who, she says, realising that he said her name instead of Shari's. Quickly, he corrected himself and says, Oh, I'm sorry, to Shari. And I was watching her a couple of weeks and uh, it just got out of hand. The next call was on the evening of Shari's funeral. And if that wasn't sick enough, the perpetrator made a collect call or a reverse charge call from Shari Smith, which makes me sick, honestly. During this conversation, he tells Dawn all about the day Shari died. He says that Shari herself picked the time that she would die and the method in which that she would be killed. He told Dawn that Shari was given three choices. She could be shot, suffocated, or be given a drug overdose. And apparently she chose suffocation. He then described having sex with Shari and told Dawn that Shari said that she was ready to depart. And I cannot even imagine what Dawn was thinking 
or feeling at this point and just how traumatic this entire experience must have been. But Dawn continued the conversation anyway, keeping him on the line for as long as she could, asking him why he had to kill her sister. He told her, quote, it got out of hand. I got scared because uh, only God knows Dawn. I don't know why. God forgives me for this and I got to straighten it out or he'll send me to hell and I'll be there for the rest of my life. But I'm not going to be in prison or the electric chair. End quote. Two weeks after Shari's abduction and murder, 24 miles or 38 kilometers away in Richland County, 9-year-old Deborah May Helmick was playing in her front yard with her father watching from inside their home just 20 feet or 6 metres away. Their neighbour could also see Deborah as she was playing outside and in a split second, the neighbour watched as a car pulled up to the Helmick's home, said a few words to Deborah before grabbing her throwing her in his car and speeding away. Both Deborah's dad and the neighbor attempted to follow the vehicle, but they eventually lost it and returned home to call the authorities. When investigators working on the Shari Smith case heard about the abduction in Richland County, they feared that the same person that had taken Shari had also taken Deborah. The circumstances, after all, were far too similar to not be connected. Both pretty, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girls snatched in just seconds from their front yards. The only difference was, this time, the perpetrator had taken a child. Although at just 17, I would argue that Shari was also still a child. And the investigation went into overdrive after this, as they feared that South Carolina now had a serial killer on their hands, and considering that the perpetrator had only waited two weeks to abduct his second victim, not to mention how brazen his method was, they believed that he would likely strike again soon if they didn't act fast. And like with Shari's abduction, no evidence was left behind at the scene, but at least this time they did have a witness. However, this time the perpetrator didn't make any calls to the Helmick family to torment them with his sick and twisted games. And in fact, this killer had stopped calling the Smith family by this point as well, which was of course great news for the Smith family, as far as having a mental break that was, but it was kind of bad news for the investigation. The calls were the only evidence that they had to work with, plus I suspect that they were probably expecting a call or relying on a call to lead them to Deborah. So the investigation was pretty much forced to devise a plan to get this guy out of hiding and get him back talking with the Smith family. And they went off the assumption that the perpetrator was following all of the news and media coverage of the investigation. So working with the media, they planned a very public memorial for Shari at her grave site at the Lexington Memorial Cemetery. During the service, Dawn was instructed to attach a small stuffed koala bear to a bouquet of flowers. And by the way, Shari collected stuffed koala bears and anyone that knew Shari knew how much this collection of bears meant to her. Friends and family also stood around at the memorial and prayed for Shari and also for Deborah. All the while, the media was taking videos, photos, and preparing to publish it. Investigators were also present, noting down passing by cars and present cars and their number plates. They would later discover that the killer had driven by, but they would only discover this after his arrest. And also worth mentioning, the idea for this very public memorial was thought up by a man from the FBI named John Douglas, aka Holden Ford from Mindhunter 
and the person that wrote the book I showed you at the beginning. If you have seen Mindhunter on Netflix, you may recall the Atlanta child murder episodes. Well, this kind of idea of using the media to bring the killer to light may ring a bell to you. Of course, if you haven't seen the show, that is irrelevant. But may I say, if you haven't seen Mindhunter and you are a true crime fan, you need to see it and then read that book. Anyway, back to the significance of the stuffed koala bear for just a moment. The reason they got Dawn to place it on a flower bouquet was because they were hoping that the killer may visit the gravesite overnight and try to take it as some sort of memento. Unfortunately, the killer never did show up that night, but the media coverage did prompt him to call the Smith family again in what I would say was his most chilling call yet. Just after midnight, the Smith family received yet another collect call from Shari Faye Smith. Speaking with Dawn, the killer said, Okay, you know, God wants you to join Shari Faye. It's just a matter of time. This month, next month, next year, you can't be protected all the time. End quote. Then he changes the subject. He asked Dawn if she was familiar with the Deborah May Helmick case. This was also, by the way, I believe the first time that the perpetrator doesn't bother to use a voice-altering device and his real voice can be heard. Have you heard about Deborah May Helmick? Following these directions, investigators were led to the body of nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick. Like with Shari, the condition of her body made it impossible to determine how she had died. By this point, the FBI had actually built up a pretty solid profile of who they thought the killer was. They believed he was a white male, mid-twenties to early thirties, divorced or at least separated, with a history of sex-based crimes. They also believed that following the two murders, the perpetrator was likely drinking heavily, losing weight, maintaining poor hygiene and a scruffy appearance, and was probably pretty keen to discuss the case with those that he knew. And lastly, because of the use of the voice distortion device, they thought he likely had a background in electronics. Although, as I said, in the last call, he for some reason stopped using this device. Maybe he got cocky? Who knows? For these calls were still all the investigation really had to work with. That was until they decided to take a much much closer look at Shari's letter. So you know when you're writing on a notebook or a notepad and you flip over to the next page and sometimes you can see the faint imprint of what you had written on the previous page? You probably wouldn't be able to read this faint imprint with the naked eye, but it is still there. And this gave the investigators an idea. You see, Shari's letter had been written on lined notepad paper, so chances were her killer likely owned this notepad and had used it previously. Therefore, by checking Shari's letter for any of these faint imprints, it might lead them to some sort of clue. A list, a name, an address, something, anything. So the letter was sent off for testing and lo and behold, some pretty exciting results came back. The first was a partial shopping list, not that exciting, but that they were also able to make out an almost complete phone number. It read 205 837 13 blank 8. With only one missing number, they only had to try 10 number combinations, 0 to 9, 
to figure out the right number and its potential link to Shari Smith. 205, by the way, was an area code for Alabama, and 837 was a Huntsville exchange, which is a city within Alabama. Investigators soon determined that one of the 10 number combinations had multiple phone calls from a home that was just 15 miles or 24 kilometers away from the Smith home. And these calls were made in the weeks leading up to Shari's abduction. So off investigators went to visit this home. Living there was a middle-aged couple named Ellis and Sharon Shepard. Their son had been stationed in the army in Huntsville, Alabama, hence their connection to that phone number. But how had their son's phone number ended up on the same notepad paper that Shari had written her last will and testament on? Unfortunately for the investigation, it turned out that the Shepherds were on vacation during both Shari and Deborah's abductions. And not only that, Ellis Shepherd just didn't fit the profile that the FBI had come up with at all. Except for one thing. He did electrical work. Disappointed that they had hit another dead end, investigators decided that they may as well ask the Shepherds if they knew anybody that may fit their current profile of the killer. And pretty quickly, they came up with a name. Larry Jean Bell. Bell had house sat for the Shepherds for six weeks while they were away on vacation. So during the time that Deborah and Shari were abducted, they also remembered that they had written their son's phone number down for Jean, as they called him, as an emergency contact. And as it turned out, Larry Jean Bell almost perfectly fit their profile. He was divorced, early 30s, living with his parents, had a history of sex crimes, and was organized and meticulous, just as they thought the killer would be. On top of that, the shepherds said that when Bell came to pick them up at the airport, he had lost weight, grown a beard, appeared a little disheveled, he was agitated, and he couldn't stop going on about the Shari Smith abduction. He also worked for Alice Shepherd doing electrical wiring. The cherry on the cake was when the shepherds were played one of the phone calls to the Smith family when no voice altering device was used and they identified the voice as that of a Larry Jean Bell. Of course the shepherds home was searched after this where they found a gun and a copy of Hustler magazine under the mattress that Bell had been sleeping in and this gun by the way did belong to the shepherds but had been missing. Upon closer inspection, it appeared that the gun had been recently fired and was jammed. In the bathroom that Belle used, they found several blonde hairs that were microscopically similar to Shari's, and they also found a page of stamps in the shepherd's home that matched up to the duck stamp used to send Shari's letter. So Larry Jane Bell was arrested and brought in for questioning. During questioning, Bell of course denied any involvement in either Shari or Deborah's murders, even though Deborah's neighbour had also now come forward and identified him as being the man who took Deborah. Then there was his criminal background. In the past, he had attempted to force women into his car at knife point, gun point. He'd made dozens of inappropriate calls to a child and committed various sexual offences during his childhood none of which earned him any sort of substantial punishment, unless you consider 21 months in prison substantial, which personally, I do not. After hours of questioning, Don Douglas, aka Mindhunter's Holden Ford, went in to speak with Belle. Douglas talked to him in a way that I suspect made Belle feel like he had a sympathetic ear. Douglas said things along the lines of, life's tough, Larry. You're going through a lot. You didn't mean to do this. You have a good side. 
I am paraphrasing, by the way. But as Douglas continues, Bell is nodding his head in agreement. Then Douglas leans in and says, When did you first start to feel bad about the crime, Larry? He responds, When I saw a photograph and read a newspaper article about the family praying at the cemetery. Douglas Sen says, Larry, as you're sitting here now, did you do this thing? Could you have done it? Larry Bell tearfully replies, All I know is that the Larry Jean Bell sitting here couldn't have done this, but the bad Larry Jean Bell could have. And that was the only confession that we ever really got out of Larry Bell. Even when Dawn and Hilda Smith came in to speak with him face to face, he didn't admit a thing. He doesn't apologize, confess. He doesn't even appear remorseful. Nothing. He simply continues to blame the bad Larry Jean Bell. In January of the following year, 1986, Bell went to trial and was eventually found guilty of the kidnapping and murder of Shari Faye Smith. He was eventually sentenced to a death by electrocution and Bell was also tried separately for the kidnapping and murder of nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick, resulting in the same outcome and punishment. And to this day, law enforcement believe that Larry Bell is actually responsible for several other murders in North and South Carolina, but have never been able to prove it. And as they barely got a confession out of Bell for Shari or Deborah's murders, they certainly weren't able to get him to talk about any of his other potential crimes. Ten years after his sentencing, in 1996, Larry Jean Bell is put to death via electrocution. And I do want to thank you for listening to the stories of Shari Smith and Deborah Helmick. And I do really recommend this book, by the way, if you want to read a totally different perspective on how Shari's case was solved and how they built up the killer's profile. Plus, it's just a great all-round book if you have an interest in true crime, which I assume if you have made it this far that you do. Thank you to my incredible channel members, my shining stars. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you soon. Bye guys.